Welcome back. I'm Mary Thompson, and this is part two in Joyful Belly's pregnancy lecture in preparing for taking care during pregnancy and taking care during the postpartum time. In part one, we looked at preparing for pregnancy. In this module, we're going to look at pregnancy months one to eight and the perinatal month, month nine. And in part three, we'll take a look at postpartum care. Pregnancy begins at what's called the first trimester. Being a nine month cycle, they break it into three different parts and each part has distinct differences. When pregnancy first begins, the woman may feel very heavy and dull, exhaustion, tired, ex need extra rest. Because her body, especially her liver, are working overtime to manage the excess hormones that are at place in the system. If an egg implanted in the uterine wall, then there was a new hormone, human chorionic gonadotropin, which began communication. This made sure progesterone levels stayed high, and it's going to start bumping up estrogen levels. Because now, since there is a pregnancy, the body's work to prepare the body for pregnancy has been successful, and now it has to ramp up to get the body ready to carry to term all the way to the end of the ninth month. Tastes may differ. There may be cravings, that are very important to heed during pregnancy. We don't see too many cravings at the early onset of pregnancy, but a woman may feel some aversion to food or some slight degree of nausea. If they are craving, they might crave kappa type foods. There are sometimes very specific food cravings and there may be very specific food aversions. Now it says here, there may be an aversion to strong bitters in the first trimester. This is because Bitters are quite often antiparasitic, and antiparasitic herbs are going to cause the body to look at this new being as a parasite, something that's drawing energy from the mother, and possibly reject it. Speaking of cravings, when I was pregnant with my son, I craved eggnog, lots and lots and lots of eggnog, so I can attest to the kappa-type food craving. As soon as delivery happened, someone poured me a glass of eggnog, and it was like, oh no, I'm done. No more eggnog drink up to a quart a day, sometimes during pregnancy. And then after that, I've had maybe three cups in the last 16 years. But my son, when October comes and he sees his first eggnog carton in the store, he must have it and he must have it as long as it's available. So I think he was the one largely driving that particular food craving. We wanna trust cravings within limits. If the craving is one that may be beneficial for the mother as such as something that's going to build kappa and if the agni was strong enough, then you can indulge it. If you wanna figure out why someone's having a particular craving, you might find something that's more supportive or healthy. Now it says here like not ice cream or pizza. So you might wanna look for, is there a particular vitamin or mineral that's lacking that's within that food? If it is that the agni is strong and the food will not harm the mother, indulgence is generally looked at as fine. As it says here, the body needs some additional calories, but not a ton. We get one extra meal a day or an extra serving at meals, typically about 300 extra calories a day. It doesn't take that much energy to grow the fetus inside, and that growth is being largely driven by hormonal shifts that are occurring in the mother's body. When we look at cravings, if we can interpret what, what's behind the craving. For example, if someone's craving chocolate, they often need magnesium because that's rich in chocolate. So when we look at the particular craving, see if there isn't something within it. There are some nutritional requirements that the baby has. Folate or folic acid is one, and you will find this in prenatal vitamins, and as I mentioned in the first lecture, you find it in very high quantity in legumes and dolls. So increasing those in the diet at this time is beneficial as well. We build bodies with proteins. So making sure the diet has plenty of protein is essential during this time. Not necessarily for the mother's body, which is building proteins as well, but for the fetal body. If the person is low in iron, iron supplements are beneficial. Floridix is a good iron supplement. It's a liquid supplement, very easily absorbed. 
quite often a reason why iron levels become low is because we don't have a strong Agni at this time. And so bringing the Agni up and then including iron rich foods is very important. Looking at vitamins, they mentioned this in the preparation phase. So if a person hasn't yet started prenatal vitamins by the time they start their first trimester, looking to get a good food-based vitamin is important. And there's the same ones listed in the, in the prenatal section, or I'm sorry, in the preparing section, Garden of Life prenatal and Whole Foods has a food cultured prenatal. Prenatal vitamins could be taken by women anytime, but they are essential during pregnancy. And we look them as very beneficial in, during the time period prior to conception. Agni. Many women experience, well, I'd say there's a broad range of experiences, a good way of putting this. Some women, appetite goes out, digestion shuts down because their body is working in the background. Um, the liver's working to manage hormones, the body's producing hormones and causing changes and fluctuations in, uh, in the way the body functions. So for some women, they don't have much appetite. For other women, they become ravenous and the appetite is very strong, and they're standing in front of the refrigerator just putting food in their mouth. And for many women, the first trimester is a time period of a lot of nausea, morning sickness. This nausea may result in vomiting, or it may just result in a queasy feeling, and it typically is related back to the degree of hormones that are in the system. When the hormonal level is high, when your liver is working to balance out that hormonal level, it's, you're going to have some degree of nausea that you're going to feel because it's like your body doesn't want to put anything else in. It's already dealing with a lot. But the great kind of paradox is a woman may feel both hungry and nauseous when she eats. And so it becomes um, a constant battle. As I said, for most women, that morning sickness resolves in the first trimester. And on rare occasions, it continues throughout the pregnancy. The sense of smell becomes very acute. Uh, John mentions that Natalie smelled car oil in a previously favorite restaurant. Um, oftentimes, food aversions are linked to the smell of the food more so than the taste of the food. That a person who may have previously loved a certain smell may no longer like it. It may be too strong. Or they may find themselves also seeking out new and different smells. The sense of smell is heightened. Now, why would that be? Well, our sense of smell is one of our early alert systems. So as Natalie walks into the restaurant and she smells that car oil, her body is saying, this is an unsafe place for you and the baby, don't eat here. Or if you walked in and you have an aversion to a certain food, it may be that there is a chemical in that food that is not desirable right now at this stage in the formation of the baby. So it makes sense that the sense of smell is heightened at this time because this is the time when the body wants, is on guard. You know, to make sure that everything that makes it past the barriers of the skin and the sense organs is going to be safe for formation of the fetus. So giving attention to the sense of smell is an important thing to do. Recognize if I have an aversion to something, let that aversion be. Leaving the restaurant if the food doesn't smell right. This is a great time to learn about foods, your relationship with them. Trust the aversions that you have to smells and tastes. And it's a good time too. I've had people who often talk about foods that they didn't care much for before and now became favorite foods. And foods that were favorites became horrible. Vegetarians may begin eating meat. Meat eaters may crave vegetarianism. Trust the way the body is going as long as you're staying within a healthy range of vitamin and mineral consumption. So we look at what's happening in the Datu and the Shratamsi during this time. In the first trimester, remember this is early in that Kappa time, and so everything is a little bit heavy. Prana, that life force energy, is kind of stymied in this stagnation of increasing Datu and sluggish movement through Shratamsi. So the energy levels may be low, the mother may feel a need to nap more often, um, she may just not feel as much get up and go as she will feel later in the pregnancy. Rasa Datu is going to be nourishing the fetus via the, well, the body nourishes the fetus via the Rasa Datu. During this very early phase, during the first month, 
the nourishment is going to transfer almost directly across through that uterine wall. And the fetus or the embryo at that time is multiplying based on its own rasa, the own cytoplasm that it brought into the equation. As soon as the placenta forms, the umbilical cord forms, what's traveling back and forth between mother and child is rasa. The immune system is suppressed throughout pregnancy. Um, the immune system, so that the immune system doesn't attack the baby, but this is going to result in the mother appearing to have greater health because she won't be reacting to colds or uh, colds, blues, viruses. Um, there's also a suppression of inflammation at this time. With the Rakdadatu, Rakdadatu is increased. I want to mention here, throughout the course of the pregnancy, the volume of the rasa and the rakta in the body increases by 50%. So at the early onset, so let me go back all the way to preparing for pregnancy. When those estrogen levels come up, the body starts building increased rasa and rakta. And then that, that building continues all through the first trimester. So with this increase in rakta, it increases oxygenation going into the mother cells, but also getting greater oxygenation and prana to, to the baby for its growth and development. Stanya, the breast milk channels, the Stanya Vahasrotas, the breast may become enlarged and sore at this time. It's really common for women at the early onset of pregnancy to feel a great deal of breast tenderness. And even to the point where a hug might be uncomfortable, that will usually go away within the first month or so, but it is one of the early indicators of pregnancy. Mutra may increase, the woman may need to urinate more often, that usually is going to be more so towards the third trimester when there's more weight on the bladder. But the body is going into a heightened sense of kind of trying to maintain homeostasis. And so with the increase in rasa, there may for a short time be an increase in urination early in the pregnancy. Then that stabilizes a bit and then it increases again. In the Manovahashrotas, there is a tendency toward depression in the early months. It's again as the woman's body is trying to balance out all these hormones. And when we have hormonal imbalance, depression is often identified. It's one of these that if the body can maintain homeostasis in a really healthful way, then we don't feel depression. We feel good invigoration from the rakta and we feel contentment with the rasa. But in this case, because of the sluggish delivery of the rasa and the rakta, we can end up with a little bit of depression, exhaustion, overwhelm, this is a big challenge here that I see, this, this idea of trying to keep up with life. When a woman acknowledges that during the first, in this early onset of pregnancy, during that time, that she wants to go within and she wants to listen to her body's needs, then she doesn't tend to have this sense of exhaustion, overwhelm, and depression. When these tend to settle in is more often when we are trying to keep up with life. Even though our body feels tired and exhausted, we're still going to go to work for eight hours a day. We're still going to do that commute. We're still going to do that active job. And so it's, it's, Ayurveda is all about listening to the body and responding to the body's needs. And I think our current lifestyle, our societal lifestyle, encourages us to suppress the body's needs. Do not listen to those body needs and do what you have to do. And that's going to lead to this exhaustion, overwhelm, and depression. Be sure to keep your off time mellow, flexible. If you need to catch up on rest, this is a good time to do it. This becomes really important, especially if the woman is maintaining that lifestyle of activity. They want to pull back and have ways that they can rest more. We know that kappa is aggravated during the first trimester. Now, this aggravation means that kappa is magnified. Not necessarily that it's aggravated, but it's going to be the mother's going to tend towards kappa type symptoms. She may experience some depression, which would be more like a, a sadness, a lethargy, um, more so than a pull the covers over your head type depression. If there is that type of depression, she may want to speak to someone. So it's here, it seems the great shift in hormones would aggravate vata, but the shift causes kappa aggravation. Now, this is because of what those hormones are doing. These are anabolic hormones. These are hormones that are going to build tissue. They're hormones that are going to kind of slow the body systems down. 
if we had a rapid loss in hormones, we're going to go into vata because we're going to lose that anabolic process. So the reason why this shift causes a kappa aggravation is because of growth. It's a time period. The body started, remember, two weeks before he even had sex, it started getting ready for pregnancy. And now that the egg is implanted and there's a lot of communication between that egg and the mother's body, hormone production for anabolic hormones increases and the body is in a full-blown kappa stage. The baby's very tiny at this time, so caloric needs not, are not great. Remember, it has gone at this, you know, from the beginning of this time, it was a single cell. You know, it was the egg and the sperm merged, and then they began to divide. By the time it implanted, it was maybe, ooh, I think it's like 128 cells. It's still very tiny, still microscopic. You couldn't see it. And during the first trimester, it's going to grow from this very, very tiny size to be about, I'm going to say, a little, a little over an, a little under an inch, I believe. So it's, it's very, very tiny, doesn't have a lot of caloric needs. So there's, when people say, oh, I'm eating for two, it's probably because their acne is high and they're feeling that, that desire, but they do want to keep the caloric intake lower at this time. As the baby grows, they'll want to bring it up. And then breastfeeding, and it, then that's when caloric intake goes crazy. We do need a lot of vitamins during this early stage of development, vitamins and minerals, and we get these largely from plant products. So incorporating lots of vegetables in the diet and fruits becomes very important at this time, as well as that prenatal vitamin. When we take vitamins, when we're trying to conceive, we assure that we have enough vitamins in the system so that once pregnancy settles in, now we have the ability to um, feed, the, feed the developing embryo. We have amassed a, uh, an amount of minerals and vitamins necessary that we can now feed. We're not coming into it with any kind of lack. Now with the doshas, morning sickness peaks in the first trimester, then typically subsides in the second. So a woman who's sick for the first three months often is not sick following that. As I mentioned before, some women get sick towards the end. Some women have um, morning sickness, which is misnamed because it can occur at any time of the day. It uh, could have that morning sickness all throughout the pregnancy. Some women have no morning sickness. Now, the next statement is going to say, you know, the strong morning sickness, it's a sign of high estrogen, that's good for the baby. But no morning sickness is not necessarily bad for the baby. What is it? Well, I have to talk a little bit about the liver, because what your liver is going to be doing is it pulls excess estrogen out of the blood and gets rid of it. So if the liver is really highly functioning, then we could have no morning sickness as well. So... I don't want to say that if there's no morning sickness, that's bad. It's just, but if there is strong morning sickness, it says, good, your, your body's producing lots of hormones. Let's support the body in uh, processing. And that's really a lot of dilute, 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 lots of water coming in so we can reduce the concentration of the estrogen that's in the system. I also think quite often with women with morning sickness that they feel an aversion to taking anything. They need, to, they need to eat, but oftentimes they're saying, I'm gonna eat crackers. I'm gonna eat something that's going to settle my stomach a little bit. So I don't think they're usually taking enough water to dilute those high estrogen concentrations. The liver needs lots of water to do its work. The digestive system needs lots of water. So I think it's kind of like our counterintuitive. We think, oh, I don't wanna take that in because I'll just vomit it back up. And we want to say, oh, okay, I'm going to take this in so I dilute the estrogen so that I don't feel the need to vomit this back up. We can see nausea and vomiting with higher levels of HCG, which was the human chorionic gonadotropin. That's the hormone produced by the communication between the egg and the ovaries. Estrogen and progesterone. And estrogen is doing its job to build all the datus of the body. And progesterone is doing its job to prevent uterine contraction. So we want these hormone levels high during pregnancy, and we're at this stage in the first trimester, we're adapting to that. We're figuring out how to live in this body homeostatically as the hormone levels rise. Um, there is a relationship that nausea and vomiting is correlated with a 50 to 75% decrease in risk of miscarriage, 
but I wouldn't have someone worry if they did not have morning sickness as long as other signs of the pregnancy are moving ahead. Um, I personally didn't have morning sickness during the first trimester, and then I got sick in my third trimester. And so, you know, there's, the body never read the book, and so it does all kinds of anomalous things. And I don't like to frighten a pregnant mom by saying, oh, if you don't have morning sickness, that's really bad. You have a greater increased risk of miscarriage. Never, never, never say stuff like that to a woman who is being driven by hormones. <laughs> it's very upsetting. So with the doshas, we have several theories that abound as to the cause of morning sickness. And they come up with, you know, nobody really knows why. What we do know is that morning sickness is worse in, developing, in developed nations in the first world. And so it probably has a lot to do with our diet and our lifestyle and an inability to kind of be in connection with nature. If we have hormone changes and the blood is stagnant, now we get these pools of hormones. And your body, remember, is always trying to create balance. So as you're moving away from balance and creating these hormones, it's trying to clear that excess hormone out. And we're in a, we're in a space where this is the new normal. And after the first trimester, the body adapts to this new normal. But it takes some time for it to recognize that this is the case. And so we suffer the consequences kind of during that early, those early months. Um, the changing hormones plus a sensitive nervous system may come into play. The nervous system controls the digestive system. And so, um, and the nervous system at the hypothalamus region is also an endocrine system. It's got that, that's the magical blending spot between the nervous system and the endocrine system. And the, and the hypothalamus controls the function of a lot of body systems. So if we get that hypersensitive nervous system, um, the body may react more strongly. If the person has a strong appetite plus high progesterone, that's going to be a problem. With my strong appetite, I eat, eat, eat. But with my high progesterone, my peristalsis is slowed down. Everything's moving very slowly. You may have more stagnant elimination, more sluggish elimination. And that means food's not going to move through the digestive system as rapidly as it had in the past. And that sets the stage for indigestion. We can also have low acidity in the stomach. Um, progesterone can slow down the production of these body fluids. And so with the low acidity, proteins will take longer to digest. And there's a greater likelihood of indigestion or maldigestion that's going to go on at the time. And then the body can feel nauseous because of this. So estrogen we know is high. The progesterone is high. Oh, this is saying, oh, some people just say, oh, it's just high estrogen. Just that's what happens when you have high estrogen. Um, and that's possible. And the reason is the liver's a little sluggish. It's not doing its job of clearing it out. We have the high estrogen production is a good thing. It's happening to sustain the pregnancy and sustain the tissues throughout the pregnancy. But if it becomes overly high, then, we've, then the body wants you to stop eating so the liver can do its work. The weakness of the liver I've, I've alluded to a couple of times. If the liver cannot process out the hormones, which is one of its many metabolic functions, then we're going to end up with some nausea. When your liver is busy, when your liver is getting some work done, it wants you to stop eating and it wants you to sleep. So what do we find happening in early pregnancy? We get nausea and we are tired. These are both indications that the liver it really is trying to do its job. And that doesn't mean we need a liver cleanse or a liver flush. It means we need to listen to the body and give the liver what it wants, which is rest, uh, kind of a smaller, a smaller diet that's rich in nutrients, but not so heavy, not so full of sugars and alcohol or coffee or anything like that. There are a number of liver supportive foods that are mentioned here, blueberry, coconut water, herbs like turmeric. These are ones that you can incorporate because the pregnant mother will have some food and smell aversions. Come in with these in very mild, low dose. You know, you're not looking at a teaspoon of turmeric paste or anything like that. You're looking at, you know, start off with an eighth of a teaspoon of turmeric in tea and see how does that feel. Turmeric also has the added benefit of being good for both the mother's skin and the fetal skin. Um, another theory here, Agni is disturbed with hyperacidity. This is why people would take dry crackers, that when we have hyperacidity, 
the body is looking to break down proteins. The dry crackers are carbohydrate, and that switches us from an acidic stomach to an alkaline stomach. And that's going to kind of calm that acidity down. So foods that settle the stomach, such as rice cakes and bread. Now remember, this is a kapha time of life. And so what are they craving? Kind of this vata, these vata foods that are dry and hard. These also absorb the acids. Um, it says absorb acids with rice cake and don't take anything with hydrogenated oils or anything highly processed. The key to treatment, the key to foods during pregnancy, all throughout pregnancy, is sattvic and abundant. So when we look at sattvic foods, we're looking at foods that are as close to the plant as possible. So hydrogenated oils would be much more tamasic. They're, they're way far away from the plant. You know, they were made in a, chemi in a lab. And so those would not be sattvic, so we'd want to avoid them. The same thing with other highly processed foods. The, further it's, the more it's processed, the further it's moved away from nature, the less it is sattvic. I wanted to mention about rice cakes and bread. We could say it absorbs the acid, but what also happens whenever we put a carbohydrate in the mouth, the body releases saliva and it releases mucousy secretions, alkaline secretions to digest this carbohydrate. The brain runs on sugar, so it gets the sugar first. So you're actually changing the pH. You may be absorbing some of the acids with these foods, but you're also diluting the acidity with the saliva and with the mucus that's being released because you put a carbohydrate in your mouth. So more about morning sickness. Um, it says, no one knows for sure. I, John, never had an ounce of success. <laughs> for people who experience morning sickness, it's very, very difficult for them to um, get on the other side of it, that they may learn tips or tricks to reduce the symptoms, but it's it, the body's going through what the body's going through, and we don't want to stop the process of what it's doing, however much we may want to minimize the symptom of it. When I looked at morning sickness or worked with it with clients or had it towards the end of my pregnancy, it always came down to the liver. And I had to look at what was I taking in and how could I be kinder and gentler to the liver. Um, if there is severe morning sickness and the person's vomiting often, you want to make sure to take care of the teeth because with vomiting, with morning sickness, what's different from morning sickness that I found from other types of vomiting, um, you know, when you're going to vomit, the body releases more saliva and there releases more mucus along the esophagus to protect it from the acidic contents of the stomach coming up. What I experienced with morning sickness was that the body didn't bother. It just was like, oh, nope, everything's coming up. And so there was no protection. There was no excess saliva. There was no uh, increase in mucus lining of the throat. There was just the acidic contents that were going to come up. And so make, being careful to take care of the teeth, rinse the mouth out after. I would even go so far as to rinse the mouth out with an alkaline water. And that could be just taking about an eighth of a teaspoon of baking soda into a half cup of water and swishing that. You don't even have to swallow it, but they can. But swishing it around the mouth to neutralize the acidity that is, that is coating the back teeth where you will get some destruction of the enamel and some degree of tooth decay. So that's what we want to avoid is that wearing away of the enamel. So it says brush your teeth, rinse your mouth promptly after vomiting. I would always rinse first. Make sure you get a lot of that acid out before you're rubbing it around. and. Uh, I don't commonly hear of women, even those who had really severe morning sickness, having done a lot of tooth damage, but being conscious of that is very important. Kimberly nannied for months, and oh, she managed for months, <laughs> for moms who had morning sickness, and she found that they did have major dental issues. So I should go back and talk to some people and find out, because it's possible that they wouldn't know about the dental issues at the time that they were pregnant and having morning sickness. These are the type of situations that would show up months down the road. Um, it says, if vomiting excessively, it could be hyperemesis gravidarum. And hyperemesis means their hyper is high, emesis is vomiting. Gravitas, I think that means during pregnancy. I've got to, I've not got to get up on my Latin. This can be very dangerous because the mother may not be getting enough 
nutrition in for both herself and her fetus. And I did know a woman who experienced this all nine months of her pregnancy. Um, she had a very hard time keeping any food down. Um, she had to take, she got to the point where the way that she had to eat was to take, like if she was eating a soup, she would have to take a spoonful of soup and then wait 10 minutes and then take another spoonful of soup and wait 10 minutes because whenever there was a high volume of food in her stomach at one time, it was brought right back up. And so, like I said, she experienced this all throughout her pregnancy. She tried everything. She was an Ayurvedic practitioner. And so she was trying all of the Ayurvedic tricks. She was also a registered nurse. So she was trying Western things. And at the end of the whole thing, she birthed a very healthy and happy baby. So it is possible, even in the case of hyperemesis gravidarum, to have a healthy have a healthy birth and a healthy child but it does pose a lot of stress on the mother's body a lot of stress in the fetal body and it's best if they're working with a medical doctor and having that observed during the time that they're during the entire pregnancy um, I've never talked to people who use motion sickness bands I, so I can't speak to that but I would you know that would be a great thing to try Motion sickness bands have a small pressure point usually on the wrist, and that is, is said to help with, with motion sickness, and that would be very interesting. I, like I said, I have not talked to women who have used that, and I haven't advised it, so I can't speak to it, but check that out if you have someone you're working with who has morning sickness. During the first trimester, we're looking at, okay, what's the quality of the ogis? Now, for some reason, they're showing us a tinea spot, so we'll find out why. The immunity is suppressed throughout pregnancy, so the immune system doesn't attack the baby, but this lowers the mother's immunity and lowers her ability to fight off infections. Um, oh, here it is. She may be more susceptible to tinea and yeast infections. Um, tinea versicolor is a skin infection that's fungal. Yeast infections, of course, are looked at as, as another type of parasitic usually your body's balance, your homeostatic balance, will prevent these kinds of situations from arising. When the Agni is challenged with this new and different state of body, when the liver is challenged and the Ogis is challenged, we're going to get an opportunity to see some of these infections. This is from John's wife, Natalie. She got a second degree burn on her arm during the second trimester when she was taking food out of the oven. And then what she found was it became infected very quickly. There was a red area growing underneath the wound. It was warm to the touch and it was spreading. And when she went to urgent care, they gave her antibiotics. And then she was fully prepared to take them. Typically, of course, we're Ayurvedic people. And so we go, oh, I don't know if I want to take the antibiotics. And it's like, okay, so let's see, what can I do initially? And this is what Natalie did. I'm going to try the natural remedy. If that doesn't work, then we'll go on the antibiotics. So she had the antibiotics there waiting to see because in the lack of OGIS, antibiotics can be your best friend. You know, if your body can't fight the infection, using something that will assist the body in fighting the infection can be beneficial. She, what she did was she added tea tree oil to coconut oil, and then she applied that onto the region of the burn. Let that on, left that on at overnight. The red area significantly shrank, looked 100% better. So she kept doing what she was doing. Tea tree, which is a great antibiotic, um, also a great antiviral and an antifungal. And so it's, she's applying that, kept applying the remedy. The infection was gone within a few days, never took the antibiotics, but she had them. She was ready. So I think the willingness, the willingness there to take the antibiotics if it's needed is important. It doesn't mean you have to take them, but the willingness to consider that there, you know, modern medicine's got some really terrific tools. And um, I don't know if this was Natalie or John, but they discussed using the remedy with the doctor before proceeding. He monitored the infection. He probably had her come back in. He didn't want to get it too far and was watching for any kind of sepsis or moving any of the redness up, the infection moving up towards the heart would be much more serious. She interpreted it, the, the, the fact that she got the infection so quickly and easily corroborated for her that it's much easier to get infections during pregnancy. It's harder for the body to combat them because the immune system is slowed down, is suppressed. 